and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you're to continue to read it in that chapter, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And I'm thankful that I have the Bible in my heart language. I'm thankful that I'm able to read it. And um, I'm looking forward to the day someday when we are able to, uh, when we're able to present uh, the Lord people with a New Testament and then hopefully one day with an entire Bible in their language. And that'll be an exciting day. Um, as much as we, we desire and we love this people group that God has impressed in our heart and as much as we desire uh, to see these people come to, come to faith in Jesus Christ, let me tell you this, there's a God in heaven who loves them infinitely more than we could. There's a God in heaven who wants to see them come to Jesus Christ, come to salvation even more than we do. And I'm grateful for that. Um, in Romans chapter 5, there is a promise um, that people from every tribe, tongue, and nation will uh, be there before the throne of God, that they will have been redeemed. And that includes even some of these smaller groups of people that maybe we've never even heard of before. Well, that includes people that, that Jesus Christ uh, died for. If you would open your Bibles with me this morning and turn to 1 Peter. Turn to 1 Peter. We'll be in 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. And um, we're going to read starting in verse number 13 in just a moment. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 13. And I hope you've been able to uh, listen to and uh, hear many of the sermons that have led up to this in this series. Um, and I really like this, this concept that Pastor Kevin spoke to me about some time ago, um, this theme of exiles. Because we are exiles in this world. We are citizens of a greater kingdom um, than the country that, that we are blessed to live in. When we get to 1 Peter chapter 2, let's start reading in verse number 13. The Bible says this, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. What does ordinance of man mean? Well, the idea is human institutions. These are authority, authorities that God has put in our lives. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise or the commendation of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Let's look at verse number 17. The Bible says four, four simple statements uh, that we're really going to, that really encapsulate much of this chapter. Uh, the first of those is honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. All four of these commands, which really, uh, really are spoken of in more depth as we look in chapters two and three, all of these commands involve deference. Deference to some degree. If you were here last week or were able to uh, watch or listen to the message from last week, uh, you would have heard a great message from Brother Lyles uh, that was focusing on, on um, being different, on living a holy, sanctified life, being different from the world that God has put us in. When we get to here to 1 Peter chapter 2 to these verses, we see that these all involve deference. These all involve submission, submission to the authorities that God has placed in our lives. If you were to continue, and I'd encourage you after today, maybe sometime tomorrow, uh, read on past the few verses that we just read just now. And read further into chapter 2 and into chapter 3, and you'll see that this theme of submission comes up uh, time after time. You'll see a, a command, servants submit to your masters, slaves submit to your masters there in this context of that day. And he's saying, hey, whether they're, whether they're kind or not, are, I, I command you to, uh, to submit. To you see in chapter 3, I believe it is, the command, wives, submit to your husbands. And if you continue in that same chapter, kind of the reverse of that, and husbands, honor your wives. And so throughout this context in Peter's epistle, we're seeing this idea of submission, of deference, of, of honor to, to those um, that God has put in our range of influence. Notice that these commands in verse 17, they all involve deference, and there's, there's no... Step over others to reach your goals. Instead, there's honor all. Honor all men. 
There's no demand your way in the family of God. Instead, there's love the brotherhood. There's no tell God what part of his will you will follow. You know what it says? Fear God. There is no obey only the parts of the government you like, as as nice as that would be. Instead, it says honor the king. Honor, in this case, in this context, honor the emperor. Honor the rulers that God has put in your lives. The year was A.D. 64. Nero was the emperor, the ruler of the Roman Empire at this time. He'd been, in, he'd been ruling over the Roman Empire for really about 10 years at this point. And he still have several more years that he would reign. And it's at this latter part of his reign as emperor that he really gets into what he became known for. If I mention Nero to you, you probably already have a thought in your mind. And it's probably not positive. Because Nero was known for his persecution against the Christians. It was the year A.D. 64 that history tells us a fire broke out in the city of Rome. A fire that destroyed much of that city. Nero apparently was, was out of town when this fire happened, but he received a lot of the blame for, uh, for this fire. And so he decided he wanted to pass that blame. And I could ask many of you in this room, you'd tell me exactly who he passed that blame on to. And it was followers of Jesus Christ. And so Nero passes the blame on Christians for this fire, and he starts another wave of persecution. It's not the first time persecution has affected uh, the children of God. In fact, if you were to read in the, in the book of Acts, you see a wave of persecution that, that emanated out from Jerusalem. And it was during that time that many Christian Jewish people were scattered from that area. And in the beginning of 1 Peter, Peter even references the churches he's writing this letter to. He mentions that there are some that are of the diaspora, the Jewish diaspora. And so Peter is writing right in the context of AD 64, right around that time, either right before persecution is getting really intense or right as it's, it's starting out underneath the emperor Nero. And he's writing to people in the area of Asia Minor. If you were to look at a, a map today, you have, and you can even see this out in the lobby, you have Iraq, you have um, Iran next to it, and then you've got Armenia and Turkey up here. That country of Turkey is Asia Minor. As you look in First Peter, the, the provinces that he's mentioning are in that part of the world. This is a part of the world under Roman control. Some of these people are going to be Roman citizens. Some of them are slaves in the Roman Empire. But here is Peter writing to them. He tells them to submit to the authorities in their life. But there is this resounding idea throughout 1 Peter that although they're in Rome, although they're under the Roman rule, they are not, first and foremost, Roman citizens. And that same idea comes true today in that here we are, many of us have the blessing of U.S. citizenship. We live here in the U.S., But first and foremost, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a citizen of the heavenly kingdom. And so as Peter's writing to this church, uh, church these churches composed of Jews and Gentiles, he encourages them, he commands them with some things to help them have an honorable testimony in the land that God has left us in. To be a witness even as exiles in the land, as exiles here in the Roman Empire and then even for us today. So today we examine four demonstrations of an honorable testimony right from our text in 1 Peter chapter number 2. The first of these is that our testimony should show that we respect everyone. Our testimony should show that we respect everyone. If you have your Bibles open still, look at verse number 17, and you'll see that first statement in verse 17 says, Honor all. Honor all men. It's not speaking specifically just about men. Um, but about people. Honor all men. All, honor all people that God has put in your lives. We should respect everyone. The believer should respect all regardless of social level, ethnic background, religious background, spiteful actions, or even antagonism towards the faith. The command of Peter in that context, their lives were not easy. Persecution was coming But the command of Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit was to honor all men. 
We should treat people with equality. God did create us equal, and we live in a blessed country where even in our founding documents, the founders of our country acknowledge that God created us all equal. Now, throughout our history, we have not always shown that. But that is a biblical principle that God has created us all equal. And first and foremost in our land, Christians should be the ones standing up, making sure that we are treating all with respect. I spent, during my college years, I spent a summer in South Asia uh, doing an internship. And it was really a big blessing. I learned a whole lot during that time. But one of those weeks, I was working with a, a missionary from the Philippines who was, who was there in South Asia, and he had an issue in the church that he was dealing with. And he, he couldn't get into details with it about it, but we were there, and, and he was offering some counseling because there were two people in the church who, who wanted to get married, but one of them was a doctor, and the other was from a different social level. If it was in India, you would call it a different social caste. And so there was some strife between the families because they were on different social levels and they didn't see how they could come together in marriage. Well, in the New Testament, what do we learn from from Paul's writings in particular? We learn that in Christ there is no bond or free. There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no male or female. We all stand Uh, We all stand in need of a Savior, and you've probably heard it said before, but the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are equal before God. We are equal in our need of salvation, and we are also equal in that Jesus Christ died for all of us and desires all to come to repentance. We should treat people with equality. In many of those cultures in South Asia, you have this idea of the the caste system, an idea that, that we, who didn't grow up with it, might even... We can look at that and we can say, yes, that's not right for you to to treat people as an untouchable where you won't help them, you won't allow them to get medical care, things like that. We can see that as wrong, but you know, in our lives and in our own cultures, we have very similar problems, very similar issues to deal with. In Christ, there are no social levels. There are no racial levels. There are blessings and problems faced by every people group in our world. In Christ, there is no advantage to wealth. Being wealthy doesn't give you a better chance of going to heaven. There is no advantage to your career or to your heritage. There is no religious background that gets special treatment in the judgments. Instead, as I said before, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And we as Christians ought to treat those around us with that same love, respect, honor, that same equality um, that, that we receive in Christ. It's easy, close to the heart of our field, it's easy to avoid or disrespect the person in, um, in the hijab, the lady in the hijab, the, the, the Muslim garb, or to even disrespect someone who's speaking Arabic. I've seen it. I've seen it in airports. I've seen the, the disrespect that can come. And yet God wants us, as lights of Christ, as lights in this world, God wants us to show that love, that honor, that respect to the people we come in contact with. Someone was telling me uh, just after the first service, they told me a story of, of a missionary um, in a Muslim country, and there was a, um, there was, they were doing a medical clinic. And they, had, they were doing services as well, and they were, they were singing, and they were really just, by the way they were acting, they were showing the joy of the Lord that was in their life. And after days of these events, the Muslim doctor who was helping them at the, at the medical clinic who had listened and heard them speak and seen the way they lived, ended up coming to Christ for a very simple reason. Because he saw the joy that was in their lives as followers of Jesus Christ. The way we live and the way we treat other people can matter and can matter for someone else for eternity. We should treat people with equality. We should treat people with grace. The Bible says in verse 17, honor all men. In Romans 12, 14, the Bible says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. That's deference. It says, Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. And what does that do? The Bible says, Serving the Lord. The way we act in our communities, the way we act with other people, is a means of serving the Lord because the way we act reflects on Him and is a testimony to the world around us. 
In 1 Peter 2, in our text, in verse number 17, the Bible says this, For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak or a veil of maliciousness, a veil to cover up evil activity, but as the servants of God. The will of God is for us to live well, well doing in our communities because it does reflect on Christ. Our freedom from bondage to sin brings us to a willing bondage to Christ. We are servants of Jesus Christ, honoring his will. In the fourth century, a different Roman emperor, we're past the time of Nero, but there's another emperor and he, just like Nero, was anti-Christian in his actions. He persecuted the church. But even he, the Emperor Julian, made the noteworthy concession that the heathens, the unbelievers, did not help even their own brethren in faith. Well, the Jews never begged. The Jewish people are a very close-knit community. They took care of each other. And then he says something about, he calls them the godless Galileans. Who do you think he was talking about? The godless Galileans, those that those that claimed the name of Jesus Christ, and he says about the Christians, supplied not only their own, but even the heathen poor. Here's a Roman emperor who hated Christians, and yet even he admitted that the Christians were showing love in their communities, were showing the love of Christ to the world around them. They were making a difference with their testimony. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 the Bible says, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. You could read in the context, but the main thing is your motive should be, for every action, your motive should be the glory of God. In the next verse, it's, in verse 33, it says, even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. What was Paul's motivation? Paul's motivation for every decision, even the inconvenient ones, was ultimately the salvation of those he came in contact with. So we see an honorable testimony means we respect everyone. But it also means, as we continue in verse 17, that we love the brethren. That we love brethren. In verse 17, the Bible says, love the brotherhood. It's a neat metaphor that God refers to the body of Christ as a family. That God refers to a church like this one as a family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Because the bond of family is much deeper than the bond of a friend or of a coworker, of some acquaintance. The bond of family runs very deep. And this is, this is really the idea that I think is being communicated here. Love as brethren, love as family. Even when the difficult times come in family, there is a very strong pull to still reconcile, to still love, even when there's disagreement. One of the biggest sources of division in the early church, if you were to look in the book of Acts, was the membership of, of one church of both Jews and Gentiles. Different backgrounds, different cultures, but they were in the same assembly, they were in the same church, and so friction arose. But you know what the solution was? It wasn't to separate them out and to have separate congregations based on your background. It was to come together, to love each other, to defer to one another. And when you get to what many would call the establishment of the office of the deacon in, in the book of Acts, you at least see men being brought to minister uh, to the Gentiles there. What you're seeing is a desire for unity in the church, a way for them to show love one to another. In John chapter 13, Jesus is preaching, and he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. In the next verse, this is what he says, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The act of unity in the body of Christ, the act of loving the brethren, even the act of loving our neighbor even beyond our church shows the love of Christ to the world around us. We all have opinions, but we need to extend grace, forgiveness, and love to our brethren in Christ. Family entails a bond closer than a friend. 
Difficulties and disagreements do come, and I think we can all acknowledge that from our own experiences, but the love never changes. Love isn't a feeling so much, so much as it's a choice. That's true in marriage. That's true all throughout life, that love is a choice. We may not always like these situations that we find ourselves in. We can still love our neighbor. We can still love the brethren. So we love the brethren, but what's, what's another command here in Peter's epistle that relates to our testimony? Well, our testimony should show that we fear God, that we fear God. Key to the Christian faith is submission to God and acknowledgement of his sovereign position in our lives. God is sovereign. You know, what's interesting is here in this context in 1 Peter, there's this command to, to submit to the human authorities. There's the command we'll look at in a moment to submit to the king. There wasn't a word in Greek at the time for for an emperor, and so it's the word king, it's the ruler of the country, whether it's a president or a prime minister or a king or an emperor or a governor, the idea is still the same. Submit to the authority. But above all other authorities in our lives, above the authority of government, above later in the chapter the authority of a master or a a boss, above that authority is the authority of God who is sovereign over our universe, the creator, God. So our testimony should show that we fear God. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16, there's not a verb here, but the idea is to live as free. And not using your liberty for a cloak or a veil of maliciousness, of, of bad behavior, of bad doing, but as the servants of God. If we fear God, you know how we show that? We act as servants of God. It is, fairly easy, it is a fairly easy choice to follow God in Jesus Christ. Uh, I, think if, I think you'd agree with me on that. If, if you're presented with the option of heaven or hell, I think we all want to choose heaven, right? If we're given the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ, if we understand, if we believe it, it's not a hard thing to follow Christ. But there's a whole lot more than just turning in faith to Jesus Christ. You look throughout the Gospels, throughout the New Testament, and you realize that being a follower of Jesus Christ involves following in his steps, as 1 Peter says. It involves sometimes even suffering. Uh, there are many in our day throughout this world who, who preach this idea that prosperity comes through, through salvation and through uh, following Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible says, though? Although God does bless and God takes care of us and he, he cares for us more than the sparrow, there's also suffering that comes. So even more than and pros, any prosperity that God chooses to bless us with, there is suffering that comes when we follow Jesus Christ. And yet it's still our joy and our privilege to be a follower of the one who loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Amen. In Proverbs 9 verse 10, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In Proverbs 8 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. But what does it mean to fear God? I think if I ask you, many, many of you would say something to the effect of it's a, it's a reverential awe. Some of you have probably heard that before. And there's truth to that. You see, God is such an awesome God, an awe-inspiring God. He is the sovereign of the universe. He is the creator God. He loves us, but we ought to respect him. We ought to fear him. How many of you have read, I'm going to go ahead and ask this, how many of you have read, or at least part of, or have, have watched a movie maybe dealing with the Chronicles of Narnia? There's quite a few hands here. I enjoyed those books as a, as a teenager, and I, I've read them even since as well. And, um, written by C.S. Lewis, a great apologist in Christianity, a great defender of the faith. In his, uh, his main book, you have uh, four children from London, and they end up in the, the land of Narnia. And uh, there's a lot, it's kind of an analogy of, um, of Christianity in some ways. And in that world, there's Aslan, and Aslan is a lion. And Aslan, as you, as you read the story, is basically an analogy for Jesus Christ. Well, when the girls are told, when Lucy and Susan are told about Aslan, about this lion, um, their first question really that comes out is, is he safe? <laughs> Here's a lion, is he safe? Well, they ask Mr. Beaver this in the story, and Mr. Beaver's response 
is actually really a big help to me. It says this, safe? I don't, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. I thought that was interesting. Here was, here was the, the lion, Aslan, who at, at, at certain points he would destroy evil. And at the end times, guess what? God will destroy all evil. God will remake his creation in a way because, only, because evil is not allowed in the presence of a holy and righteous God. We ought to fear God because God is powerful. God is sovereign. God has shown throughout history his need to keep evil from him. And yet God is so gracious and loving that he gives us a very clear and simple path to come to him through his son. We ought to fear and respect the loving God. We need to love our Savior. I think maybe the best way of thinking about this, the fear of God, is that in our lives we all have things and people that we fear in some way, that we greatly respect, or sometimes um, there, there's a bit of intimidation there sometimes as well. And yet above all the different authorities in our lives, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in the courtroom with a judge, whether it's a police officer, or, or whether it's a parent, in all those different authorities, all of those authorities are people that we're supposed to submit to, as this passage tells us. But above all of those is the command to fear God, to follow our God. As we continue in our text, 1 Peter 2, verse 15 to 16 says this, for so is the will of God, that with well-doing, your good deeds, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Um, I don't have a lot of time to get into this, but the accusations of people who don't understand your lifestyle. Here we are, we're exiles in our world. People don't always understand that. Especially in our field, people don't understand the turning your back on the faith you grew up with to follow Christ. But even in that context... It's by our good deeds that we may silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, not using our liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, doing the will of God from the heart. What do we do when our earthly authority is contrary to God's commands? The order of the commands here is fear God, honor the king. And I think I can put them in a level just like that, fear God, honor the king, because this is something that the whole testimony of Scripture speaks to. There are many times in history, and you could argue quite convincingly that there are times in our country right now even, where the, the directions of the government conflict with the commands of God. And there are, there are many situations of this, especially in, in countries that we would consider um, restricted or persecuted countries. There are many examples of this that we could give. But there are examples in Scripture we can look at as well, where the government comes in conflict, conflict with God's will. In Exodus chapter 1, Moses, it's about the time of Moses' birth, and Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, sends out a, a decree that he wants the midwives to, to kill the Hebrew sons that were born, to throw them into the Nile River. And yet the midwives refuse to do so. In fact, in, Hebrew, in Exodus 1.17, the Bible says, but the midwives, the next two words, feared God. The midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. They were willing, even though there were consequences, even though there was risk to their very lives in disobeying the Pharaoh, the king, they were willing to follow God's will in spite of the consequences. In the book of Daniel, we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew children. They had, they had quite the reputation in uh, the kingdom. They had a good reputation. In fact, later on, they would be rulers in the land um, underneath the, the, the ruler there. And so you've got um, Nebuchadnezzar, you've got leaders above them. But here they were, they'd showed themselves, they'd proven themselves to where they were given a, a reign of influence. But a time comes when the king builds the image and demands worship of this image that he had set up. And the Hebrew children realized this was in direct contradiction to the instructions of their God. You look at the very first two commands of the Ten Commandments and what do they have to do with? Don't worship another God. Don't create another, don't create a, a graven image. And so here they are, they're being faced with a decision. 
We could just go ahead and bow down. Maybe we won't even say anything, but we'll just bow down. We'll just try to blend in, and we'll be okay. Or, as they chose to do, to refuse to bow in spite of the consequences. And in this case, the consequence would be their, their lives would be put in jeopardy in the fiery furnace. And when they stood, when they eventually, when they refused to bow both times, and they're eventually taken to be thrown into the fiery furnace, they didn't know whether God would save them alive, whether God would keep them safe in that fiery furnace. And yet, in spite of the risks, they refused to bow down. They respected the king, and even in their speech there before the king, they respected him, but they refused to contradict the commands of God. They refused to disobey God's commands. Why? They feared God. Amen. They feared God. Our fear of God motivates us to behave as bondservants to him, though he has made us free. In John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus mentions uh, that whosoever committeth sin is the servant in bondage to sin. In verse 36, if the Son, who's the Son? Jesus Christ. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. There is freedom found in Christ, but there is also freedom, not only freedom from a bondage to sin, but freedom to follow Christ with our lives, to serve Christ with our lives. Freedom to be the servant of God. And so we have this command to fear God. Our fourth testimony that show, should show that we respect authority. But how do, and we've talked about this a little bit, how do submission and our status as exiles and sojourners, sojourners in this world relate? The Bible does instruct us to submit to government, but our ultimate submission must be to God. The prior command is fear God. So what's our default position? Our default position is obedience, submission to the, to the authorities that God has ordained in our lives. 1 Peter 2 in our text, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Why? For the Lord's sake, for the cause of Christ, that our submission to the earthly authorities would be a good testimony to the world around us. In verse 17, it says, honor the king. In Romans 13, the Bible says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of, but from God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And so our default position is honor and submit to the government Honor authority even when, let me put it this way, when they persecute you. Here we are, we're in First Peter, we're in the context of Nero's reign, we're in the context of great persecution coming, and yet Peter's admonition is to honor, to submit to the king. It's difficult for many. We would like to be in charge, but God wants us to be submissive to authority. We are exiles in our world. And sometimes, because we're exiles, because our citizenship is first and foremost as a follower of Jesus Christ in the heavenly kingdom, there's sometimes conflict with the earthly kingdom. So sometimes we can't, in good conscience, obey the authorities that God has placed over us. And that's what we've seen in Egypt. That's what we've seen um, in, uh, with Daniel and with the three Hebrew children in the book of Daniel. In places of persecution, the Christian exile faces hardship because of his or her faith. In such instances, the lifestyle of the exile, the lifestyle of the Christian, creates friction with the earthly kingdom. But the point of this passage, I believe, is that, hey, let's make sure that the points of friction are, are basically the ones of spiritual significance. As much as I would like in April or in July this year not to send in the check to the government, not to finish off paying my taxes, not to reconcile that, as much as I wouldn't like to do that. And when Jesus was asked about that very thing in his ministry, you know what he said? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. But what's the next part of that? Render to God the things that are God's. When Jesus asks for the tribute coin in that context, he says, whose image and superscription is on this coin? It was Caesar. It belongs to Caesar. But there are different realms. There's Caesar's realm, and then there's the realm that trumps that, and that's the realm of the heavenly kingdom. And the question that's not asked there, but is kind of implied, the coin has Caesar's stamp on it, but whose stamp is on you? 
Here he's speaking to the religious leaders. And the question really, that wasn't asked as the religious leaders leave, kind of in the middle of a conversation, I think, that question, whose stamp is on you, resonates to us today. Who is stamped on your life? Do we just carry the name of Christianity on our Facebook profile or in the fact that we come to church on a Sunday morning? Or throughout our lives, throughout each day, are we living in such a way that we show that stamp, that image and superscription of our lives that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? In 1 Peter 2, following our text, there's another command to submit, and yet this subjection is not to the government. This one is servants and slaves to their masters. Not only to the good and gentle. In verse number 20, the Bible says, if when ye, But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. But those points of conflict are those ones that relate to spiritual significance. And those we see here are acceptable with God. Our most important action should be multiplication. We've seen that our default position should be obedience. Our most important action should be multiplication. In 1 Peter chapter 3, still in our context, verse, verses 1 and 2, we see a command, likewise ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. Why? What is the reason for submission? What is the reason for honor uh, to those in our lives? That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That those who do not follow the word, that might by the conduct of a person in their lives come to an acceptance of Jesus Christ. The reason for submission is as a light to the world around us. In our field, in our part of the world, the government forbids proselytizing, as they call it, Christian proselytizing. It's against the law for you to try to convert someone to Christianity. It's against the law in the official language to, to distribute Christian literature, whether it be a gospel tract or an entire Bible. And yet, there is a need, there is a command that occurs in Matthew chapter 28, among other places. That command right before Jesus Christ leaves this earth, right before he ascends into heaven, and it's a command that supersedes all government authority. It's a command to go ye therefore to teach all nations. What does that word teach there literally mean? It means to make disciples. That very idea of proselytizing is something that we as Christians are commanded to do. It's the core of our Christian life. It's the reason that we are still here. People have made a lot of jokes about 2020 and, and uh, looking forward to the future, how we'll refer to 2020 because um, someone, I saw a shirt the other day, and it said 2020, and it had, a, it had one star out of five. I do not recommend. <laughs> and just because it's been a crazy year. Well, when we think about it, when we think about our responsibility as Christians, regardless of the difficult times, you know, we're looking forward to a heavenly kingdom. We're looking forward to something a whole lot better than 2020. But the reason we're still here even in 2020 is to be a light to our world, to be a light to the people around us. Central to the Great Commission is the idea of making disciples of all nations. We submit to the authority of human government within the boundaries of God's instructions for us. Remember the context. First Peter. Who's in control of Rome? It's Nero. What's on the horizon? It's persecution. But what's Peter's command? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he gives four commands. They relate to submission, to deferring to others. First, Honor, respect everyone. Second, love the brethren. Love the family of God. Show your unity. Third, fear God. Fourth, honor the king. Respect authority. You know, we're not in the same context they were in First Peter. We're not in the same context as people across this globe living under serious persecution for their faith. And yet we still have the same responsibilities. We are exiles. We're citizens of the heavenly kingdom living in a world that doesn't understand the faith that we have and the the lifestyle we have in Jesus Christ. But what do we need to do? Just those things. Love your neighbor. 
Love God first and foremost. Fear God, honor the King. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come together with other believers to worship you, to open your word and to, to learn from it, to glean from it. Lord, I pray that you'd work in each of our hearts. I don't know everybody who's here. I don't know um, their spiritual state. But Lord, I do know one thing. Each one of us can take another step closer to you. It might be that first step of, of accepting Jesus Christ. It might be a step in changing the path of our life in order to follow you. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to honor you with our testimony. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand quietly in this moment of meditation and reflection with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and would you examine your own life and your own heart? Which one of these aspects of obedience detracts from your gospel witness? Which one of these four areas gives cause for unbelievers to look at your life and say, there's no change, there's no difference in them? Do you respect those around you of all races, ethnicities? Do you love the church of Jesus Christ? Do you fear God? Is that demonstrated through obedience, through respect, and the way that you honor his word? And then finally, do you live in subjection to your government authorities? 1 Peter chapter 2 is very clear that as exiles, this is one way that we demonstrate that Christ has changed us. Would you take a moment? Would you reflect on this? Would you examine your own life? Would you be honest before the Lord? If there's a need to repent, repent. If there's a need to turn, turn. Let's take a moment. our voices and sing this first verse together. May it be the cry of our heart. May we surrender our rights for the sake of the gospel. I surrender our gift cards. We're going to give gift cards to the Lord, too. Just get, these are our commitment cards. These, we call them our uh, Global Impact Offering Card, where members of our church, regular attenders, just communicate with the elders and the church leadership about their planned giving uh, by faith over the next year so that we can wisely encourage the church and lead the church in our missions program. And so we've already established our missions budget for the year, and that was based in large part on, on your communication back to us at the last end of last year's conference. Uh, we, we get that kind of commitment in August and 1st of September. We start our budgeting process uh, in October, November, and present it to the church then uh, in January. And so uh, that's kind of how we formulate. We want to continue to support all the missionaries we're doing and uh, take opportunities to do uh, extra love gifts and then take on new missionaries like what we've heard today in this project Persia, Persian project. So um, we want to hear from you. We pray that if God has increased you or given you more uh, in your hand, that you would be using what he places in your hand for his glory, for the spread of his fame, spread of his name around the world. So we pray that you're consider we, we hope that you are praying about what you will do
for missions. And you can communicate to, the, to us by filling out one of these cards and giving that in an offering, or you can go online, and you can do it online as well, under our missions page on our church website. So we encourage you to do that sometime this month. Also, there's opportunities to sign up to be a, a prayer warrior, in a sense, or to pray for our missionaries. If you sign up, you will get an email that has special prayer requests from our missionaries. Uh, some of our missionaries sent in requests just to our church just for this month because they knew we were praying for the, these special requests this month. So if you haven't done that, we encourage you to do that. It is good to see you. We encourage you to fellowship. Um, if you want to do that outside, we encourage you to, to fellowship one with another uh, as we respect each other's space. We're not being socially distant while we're being physically distant uh, as we're being asked to and being wise about that. Continue to pray that God will give our church safety and health, and I'm so thankful that he has. Um, but we also want to be wise and not presumptuous about how we interact with one another. It was so good yesterday here on the property to see our young bunch of young people from the community and from our own church out here playing soccer, and so I hope you're praying for that outreach. Uh, and uh, if you want to be encouraged, just get around a bunch of kids who are, um, you know, playing soccer and having fun, and um, it's kind of like the cares of the virus vanish when you put a ball out there. It's awesome, so come out and do that. And then again, come back tonight. We'll be talking more with Nathan. You'll get to meet his wife, Alicia, uh, and find out about their ministry and how they're going to be living, where they're going to be living, what their plan is, so that they can translate the scriptures into the uh, Lurie language. All right? I we'll encourage you to come back. That'll be at 5 o'clock tonight. And then this Wednesday, um, on our church website, you will be able to see from any time from 2 o'clock to 10 o'clock, there'll be a, uh, about a 35 to 40 minute conversation I have with four of our missionaries concerning culture shock, and dealing with, you know, transitioning your, your family into a new culture. And one of the individuals you'll re re really connect with, and that's our friend Phil, who's on this particular Zoom call. So you'll, you can connect and watch that. Do that this Wednesday because it'll be taken off, uh, uh, off the uh, internets um, after uh, this Wednesday at 10. All right, let's, let's pray. God, you've been so good to us today. We've heard from you. Your word has been clear and, and convicting and challenging in our own hearts, Lord. And I pray the Spirit of God would remind us of these commands as we contemplate even how to live. Lord, everyone we interact with this week has been addressed in the text on how we should respond to them. Find us faithful. Find us obedient in all of these ways for your glory, for the sake of the gospel. We thank you for the word we've heard. We thank you for the one who preached it to us. We pray you'd bless the ministry that you've called him to, and that, Lord, you'd give clarity and wisdom to our church on how we can partner with that ministry to bring the gospel to places that are yet in darkness. We pray, Lord, do this good work in our midst and through our church for your glory. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, you're dismissed.